I'm Mustafa Beg. I'm a lecturer at the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies at the University of Exeter. I was born in Britain and as a Muslim growing up here as a religious minority, growing up I had a number of questions and some of those questions were how does Islam or Islamic law particularly relate to me as a Muslim living in a non-Muslim country? Because there are about almost two billion Muslims in the world depending on what figures you look at. And uh, most of those Muslims obviously live in Muslim countries. But there are a significant amount of Muslims that live as minorities in non-Muslim lands. So as a researcher, I became more and more interested in how does Islamic law relate to me as a Muslim living in Britain. So if you look here, you can see that Islam started out in what is today known as Saudi Arabia and there is uh, Britain today. So you can see kind of the distance from the two regions and most of the Muslim world is around here on the map where you can see. So Islam started out here in Arabia. This is a, a map of Arabia before the advent of Islam. And the Prophet Muhammad was born, here you can see on the map, a place called Mecca in the Hijaz province of the Arabian Peninsula. And it is Islam's most holy site. It's famous for uh, the black cube-like building called the Kaaba. You can see a, a model of it here. That's where he was born. And that's the direction towards which Muslims pray. And once in their lifetime, they uh, must make the pilgrimage to Mecca if they can uh, afford to do so and if they are physically fit enough to, to get there. And then he migrated to a place further north there on the map, you can see called Medina. So that's the place where he migrated. So Islam was established in these two cities, in Mecca where he was born, and then in Medina where he established the mosque of Medina. And you can see uh, this model here uh, of, of the mosque in Medina, and it's, it's famous for its uh, green uh, dome there. So that's where Islam started off, but it continuously spread across the Arab world and also into other regions. And then you had Muslims also that migrated to non-Muslim lands. So when Islamic scholars started to write about Islam, and uh, you saw that they were writing books in Islamic law, they were predominantly writing for a Muslim audience that was living in a Muslim land and addressing Muslims that lived within Islamic jurisdictions. But then there were Muslims that were traveling outside of what you call the Islamic territory to non-Muslim territories. And usually that was for things like trade, okay, going and doing business, uh, traveling abroad, and then coming back. And how we find Islamic law developing is that it comes out often as a series of questions from a student to a particular teacher. And these teachers would be very early on in Islamic history, so just kind of like a generation or two after the Prophet Muhammad, when they look at the sources of Islamic law, which is a book that you uh, may all be familiar with, which is the Quran, the, the, the sacred text for Muslims. And they will also look at the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. They're the two main scriptural sources. They're the scriptural sources that Muslims look at to, to work out and derive Islamic rulings. So they would go to a teacher usually, or a teacher would be surrounded with students, and there would be like a conversation, a dialogue, um, like this one here. And this one particularly addresses the topic that I'm interested to talking about today, which is how does Islamic law operate in a non-Muslim land? So this is one student asking the teacher, in this case uh, Abu Hanifa, about uh, if they are in a non-Muslim territory, you can see there's an Arabic word there, we won't go into detail, called Darul Harb, I prefer to use um, the Arabic terms in a lot of my academic work because sometimes we don't have exact translation for these kind of things. And if you do try to do it, sometimes it gives the wrong meaning. So he's been asked about, is it permissible to marry a, a, a non-Muslim woman, basically a Christian or a Jew, which you are allowed to do in Islam, as long as they believe in some kind of scripture. But are you allowed to do that if you're in a non-Muslim country, if you're visiting a non-Muslim country? And the, he answers that, uh, yes, it is allowed to do so, but he disapproves of it. So he said, why do you disapprove of it? And he said, because I disapprove of his living in it. So you can see, although Muslims were traveling for purposes of trade to non-Muslim lands, uh, the scholars were averse to Muslims actually living in non-Muslim lands. I mean, for at least for any long 
long period. But anyway, that's quite a long passage there. But when they wrote books of law, when Islamic law books got developed, they didn't have these kind of conversations like, you know, I asked and he replied. This is one way of, you find the way that early Islamic law is articulated. Not all of it, but this is one of the ways. You'll see it become much more condensed into rules because that's what people are really interested in, is not how the dialogue took place, but what is the rule? How can we use this for purposes of law? And how can we teach students what the law is? So it will say something like this. So this is from a teaching text which would be taught to students of law, which says, if a Muslim enters non-Muslim lands as a trader, it is not per permitted for him to infringe on their property and life. Just a couple of things I'd like to say here. Uh, first of all is the fact that Muslims could enter non-Muslim lands because he wouldn't say if a Muslim enters non-Muslim lands. So it shows that it's permissible to live under non-Muslim rule because in the first passage we saw that he was disapproving of it, but it is allowed. So something can be disapproved, but can still be allowed. And it says as a trader, because that's just telling us a little bit about history, you see. It tells us historically the way that Muslims went to non-Muslim lands was to do trade and was to do business, right? It is not permitted for him to infringe on their property and life. Now that bit I'm really interested in, for me as a Muslim in a non-Muslim land, which basically means that if you're a Muslim and you live in a non-Muslim country, you have to abide by the laws of the land. So when we were growing up, especially when I was in college and university, and there were lots of these questions about, you know, Islam or Muslims and terrorism or Muslims not abiding by the law or not being loyal to the land or loyal to the law of the land um, and somehow being involved in activities that would be damaging to people, property to the state. Islamic law actually doesn't allow that because it says it is not permitted for that individual to infringe on their property. I mean, it's a, a hurt is meant as well, but just because the books use the masculine, I've stuck to the literal translation of him. They are not allowed to break the law of the land. And you can see here that that, that text is from a person from the 11th century. This text is from the 19th century. It's the same text, but this scholar here has put a gloss on it, what we call is like an explanation in brackets for some of the things that might be am ambiguous. And you can see that it's the same text. My translation is not the exact same on both texts, but it's the same text. And in brackets here, you can see he's put or other means. That means when they mention trade, they didn't mean only as traders, because for law, every word matters. In case some people thought, oh, this 11th century authority of Islamic law says only for traders, does it mean? So he removes that ambiguity by saying, no, not only by trade, but there could be other means. And that means by the time you get to the 19th century, there were people traveling to non-Muslim lands for other reasons other than trade as well. And just a quick text I put up here is because this does not belong to any particular school of law, this particular book, the other one did, it belonged to the Hanafi school of law. This one represents all the schools of law. I mean, the author does belong to a school of law, but he's, he mentions all the opinions in there. And there's consensus on the fact that Muslims have to obey the land, the law of the land in which they are in, and they should not break the law. They cannot attack people or their property and live, uh, let others live in safety whilst they are there. So um, these books of Islamic law, as I mentioned, can be um, uh, larger conversations. And some of these books span a number of volumes. Some of those books span uh, just maybe a single volume with just a little bit of text. Why? Because the purpose for those books was to teach. But when they want to give details and commentaries, we may get a book in Islamic law, which is the size of this one. Now this here, you can see, is one book. It's six volumes. They do get longer than this, by the way. They can get up to about 30 volumes as well, right? But it wouldn't fit here. So that's one book. And you can see that's one bit of text writing there, right? Going all across all six volumes. And you can see the volumes are in English here as well. That's handy. So that's a six volume book about Islamic law. And here you see a shorter book, which is three volumes. So they can vary in size, anything from 30 volumes to sometimes just a few pages if it's a condensed summary of Islamic law. So it depends what you're looking at. So an issue like this would just be mentioned here in say one passage um, in, 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 in the Arabic writing, um, saying what the actual issue is. So just uh, moving on then, from that they develop some more ideas about Islamic law as well. So one of those things was, does Islamic law actually operate in a non-Muslim country? Right? Can you actually use Islamic legal rules in a non-Muslim land? Of course, 
Muslims obey Islamic law in the sense of prayer, ritual, you know, fasting in Ramadan and these kinds of things, right? But when it comes to other issues to do with, let's say, commercial law, financial law, um, to do with business dealings, because we are talking about business dealings, Islamic law doesn't operate there. So if a Muslim is traveling to a non-Muslim land as a trader, as we just mentioned, right, what kind of rules do you apply then? So you can see from this text here, Islamic rules don't really apply. So if there's an infringement of the law or something happens, uh, Islamic law cannot apply to that particular country. So if they take the case back to a Muslim country, let's say they find that same individual in a non-Muslim country who they had a dealing with in a non-Muslim land, an Islamic judge, according to this particular school of jurisprudence, would say, we can't do anything because it happened in a non-Muslim country. Again, that's interesting for me because growing up here as a Muslim, and if there were people who didn't, you know, who were Muslims, but probably didn't know a lot about their religion, said, we want Islamic law to be implemented in Britain, for example, you know, Sharia for the UK, right? There's no basis for that in Islamic law, because here you can see that Islamic law where it does not operate, where there's no jurisdiction of Islamic law, Islamic legal rulings don't apply. And then you have, again, rulings like this, short rulings like there is no usury between a Muslim and a non-Muslim non -Muslim land. Why is that significant? Because interest is prohibited for Muslims. So when Muslims deal with each other, they cannot, they cannot engage in interest. This particular legal school, when it comes to a non-Muslim country, non-Muslim rule with Muslims and non-Muslims, they do allow transactions to take place that involve ostensibly what is called interest. And then in a book like this, if you go to a larger book, which has more volumes in it like this one, they'll give more details and the reasons why. Because the Prophet had said that there is no usury between a Muslim and a non-Muslim in non-Muslim land. So um, that would be the basis, the legal reasoning behind it. And there are some kind of logical reasons given to why that's the case as well. And also then, the issue about ritual that I mentioned, that Muslims in a non-Muslim land are allowed to organise their own uh, things like the Eid prayer or the Friday prayer, which is normally organized by the state. So things like this can take place because then the Muslim scholars there will take the role of judges like and uh, take the role of like leaders that will organize uh, state worship practices like uh, the Friday prayer and the Eid prayer. So that's given you a kind of an idea of how Islamic law operates, looking at the sources, as we saw here, using the prophet, the prophet saying, in these particular ones, we didn't really see the Quran in, in, into play. We saw even things like consensus being used. So after the scriptural sources of the Quran and the words of the prophets, they use other tools like consensus. You saw things like analogy being used. They might have a rule, but they don't have a, a, a rule for this exact particular case. So then, then they'll use a case which is similar and they'll do analogy on that. If there's nothing mentioned again in the Quran or the Prophet's words, they'll see, did the, all the jurists agree on something? Yes, there's a consensus. So they will use something like consensus as well. So for this presentation, I did try to show that uh, how Islamic law is relevant for Muslims today living in countries like Britain, which is a non-Muslim society, a non-Muslim country in which we have significant Muslims. What can they do to regulate their affairs whilst living under non-Muslim rule? Thank you very much. I hope that was informative.